Number 10, Lindsay Lohan. In the early 2000s, Lindsay Lohan faced a ton of public scandals, but one that's not talked about often enough actually took place behind the scenes of a little show called Ugly Betty. Lohan was a guest star on the show in the third season playing Kimmy Keegan. Kimmy was supposed to stick around for six total episodes, but that number was shrunken down to just four. The reason being was her co-star and, you know, the lead of the show, America Ferreira, just didn't get along with Lindsay on set. According to America and several of the Ugly Betty crew members, Lindsay would just show up with an entourage of people, usually under the influence of herbs and spices, and the production crew had to repaint her dressing room when she left because it was just so messed up. One crew member alleged that she would cut images of her own face out of magazines and tabloid articles as if she were making a collage of some kind. America claims that one scene took over 30 takes to get right because they just kept flubbing their lines. Lindsay's team of buddies have been adamant that America had too much power and was the sole reason that she was asked to leave the show. Unfortunately, if you do bad things, and enough people know about it, karma comes around. Number nine, Julianne Moore. Ah, creative differences. The phrase that has been behind some of the most tragic Hollywood stories in films that could have been, and in this case, roles. For an industry centered around creativity, the movie industry can be awfully risk averse, especially when it comes to the decision of casting a lead. Now, it's not uncommon for actors to suddenly be thrust out of productions in lieu of a new face, or in some cases, the original choice that you were replacing. A good example of doing it yourself, though, is Julianne Moore, the actor from films like the 2013 reboot of Carrie and the action flick Kingsman Golden Circle, was set to play the leading lady in the critically acclaimed dramedy Can You Ever Forgive Me? And she was casted as the character Lee Israel, a writer who falls out of step with current culture and decides to embellish her writing, basically inventing the concept of fake news. Julianne began filming her scenes, but was asked to leave the production only one month into filming. According to the director Nicole Hollifner, portrayal of her character just wasn't what she had in mind while writing. Julianne played the role with too much of herself influencing the overall appeal. When directed to try to play the role another way, Julianne continued to give a similar performance and she was ultimately replaced by Melissa McCarthy, better known for her more comedic roles in movies like The Heat and Bridesmaids, but her turn as Lee is considered to be one of her greatest acting achievements of all time, even landing her a nomination for Best Actress at the 2019 Oscar ceremony. Julianne didn't take the news all that well, but did eventually move on and has made a couple of solid flicks since, so eh, it all worked out in the end for everybody. Number eight, Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler is best known for his role as the Fonz on Happy Days, and he was set to direct Tom Hanks in the much-loved buddy cop movie, Turner and Hooch. Unfortunately, these two had a pretty rough history together before that. The Fonz had actually fought with Hanks in character on the set of Happy Days for an episode a few years before, and it would appear that Tom wishes that he could fight Henry for real. As rumor has it, the two of them just didn't get along at all, so much so that a few days into filming Turner and Hooch with Henry behind the wheel, Tom Tom ordered Winkler to be removed from the set and replaced as director. That's the kind of power Tom Hanks wheels. He can just walk on set and be like, no. Not only did Tom complain that Henry's behavior as director was annoying, he complained that Henry was just overall bad at his job. It would take double the average time to reset a shot on set, he had minimal control over his actors, and he was apparently very frustrated with having a dog on the set. Like, did he even read the script before he took the job? That dog is a national treasure. What makes this firing even more tragic is the fact that when Winkler was delivered the news, one of the film's producers ripped Henry's contract up in front of his face. Over over the years, when asked about the incident, Henry denies that he's ever had any kind of personal or professional issues with Tom Hanks. Tom's never given us any reason to think that he would lie about something like that. What would he have to gain? Huh? I defeated the Fonz. Hey, so did ABC when they canceled his show. Number seven, Jean-Claude Van Damme. The Belgian actor Jean-Claude Van Damme was just on the verge of coming into his own career as the muscles from Brussels when he landed a job opposite of Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1987's action flick, Predator. Now, this sounded like the perfect casting choice, right? Jean would have worked alongside the likes of Carl Weathers and Jesse Ventura. And while that may have turned out cool, the reality was that Jean wasn't casted to play a role as one of the Marines at all. Instead, he was casted to play the titular Predator himself. The special effects artist behind the project called the experience with Jean as a hilarious comedy of errors, in which nobody knew exactly what the other was expecting. Apparently, nobody had informed Jean that the role was basically just a glorified 
stuntman. They were prepared to direct him to just hop around like a frog, but John was obviously confused and upset with this choice. According to John, he had just gotten off the boat, and he was under the impression that he was going to be showcasing his martial arts skills to the world, but was instead reduced to a massive, slow-moving alien with dreadlocks. To the surprise of absolutely nobody, Van Damme was furious and dispirited about spending this entire movie coked up in a clunky and often ridiculous looking suit, and was ultimately fired and replaced with Kevin Peter Hall. The idea that he was just on set like, I can barely move in this thing, just brings me so much joy. Number six, Shia LaBeouf. In 2013, Alec Baldwin was attached to star in a Broadway production of the show Orphans, alongside Transformers alumni Shia LaBeouf. Now from day one of rehearsal, Shia and Baldwin were at each other's throats. Shia's problem was that Alec was not off script. This was something that he considered to be very unprofessional. Shia has since claimed that he was so nervous about the show that he made sure to memorize his lines before he even set foot on the stage. His methods were not reciprocated by Alec, who simply showed up with coffee in one hand and a script in the other one, planning to rehearse in the moment. Shia was furious and apparently yelled at Alec to learn his lines right now. He was the lead. That's the deal. After a couple of weeks and one particularly rough day, where Shia blew up at him in front of a ton of cast and crew, Alec took five and had a meeting with the producers. He said that if Shia wasn't let go, that he was going to quit. Well, producers caved and Shia was let go. In the tabloid, they claim creative differences, but Shia later shared his side, clearly upset with being dropped as if he meant nothing to the show. Number five, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper is one of the groundbreaking actors and directors of the 1960s and 70s, New Hollywood. Now, eventually finding his niche in the early 90s, playing villains in films like Speed, Waterworld, and the live action Mario movie where he plays Bowser. Yes, that exists. No, it's not good. So, it came as no surprise when he was casted to play Kristoff, the all powerful TV producer controlling Truman Burbank's life in the film The Truman Show. The cast was stacked and it included Hollywood heavyweight Jim Carrey as the titular Truman. Anyone with a brain cell would have been excited to be a part of this movie, still considered to be one of Jim's best dramatic performances. However, two days into filming his scenes for Kristoff, which were only supposed to take 10 days to film, Hopper was unceremoniously let go from the set. Apparently, Dennis had a contract in place with producer Scott Rudden that he would be fired should his work be unsatisfactory. He must have been pretty bad in the role as the director Peter Weir has been described as extremely reluctant to ever remove an actor from a movie. Reports later surfaced that Hopper was basically half asleep while playing the character, and while Kristoff wasn't written to be, you know, a manic madman, he did require just a little bit of effort to be properly portrayed. Ultimately, Ed Harris stepped in to play the role after production had been desperately trying to replace Dennis to avoid having this film be shut down entirely. Thankfully, that never happened, and the Truman Show has gone on to be one of the most depressingly heartfelt films Jim Carrey has ever made. Oh, and Ed actually got nominated for an Oscar, so sorry, Dennis, looks like they made a good move. Number four, Eric Stoltz. All right, here, let's talk about a little bit of the 1985 comedy sci-fi Back to the Future. I loved this movie growing up. The story followed Marty McFly, a high school student who's accidentally sent back to 1955 in a DeLorean invented by his close friend and scientist, Dr. Emmett Brown, played by Christopher Lloyd. And no, we're not going to talk about that friendship, even though it's a little strange. And they're forced to get his future parents together before he disappears from existence. Now, whoever pitched this movie must have been lacking some sleep. The film went on to spawn two sequels, creating what's considered to be one of the greatest film trilogies of all time. And while Michael J. Fox may have played the iconic Marty McFly, he actually wasn't the first actor to put on that puffy vest. A young man named Eric Stoltz was initially casted to play the role. You may not recognize Eric because his most famous character was drenched in prosthetics and makeup, playing the character of Roy L. Dennis in the film Mask, a man with severe facial and skull deformities. He was nearly halfway through shooting this movie when the news came that he was going to be replaced by Michael J. Fox. Fox was the director Robert Zemeckis' first choice, but he was initially unable to sign on to the project because of his prior commitments to the show Family Ties. Eventually, though, the two studios were able to find a way to make it work and allowed him to film both projects. This is why you may notice that a majority of Marty's scenes that take place outside are at night, because it was the only time that he could film for, like, 60% of this movie. Robert wanted Eric out from the very beginning, though, because his portrayal of the character was just too intense, a lot more intense than the writers had in mind, not to mention Eric read the end of the movie as a tragedy instead of a happy ending. Uh, spoiler alert for a movie that's like 
40 years old. Uh, at the end of the first film, Marty returns to 1985 after successfully getting his parents together, but instead of being poor and depressed, the family is thriving and successful, and somehow Eric took that as Marty being an outsider in a world he didn't know. But just like, look at the truck he has parked in his garage, like nothing tragic about that. His intensity combined with his depressing performance of the finale got him kicked off of the film only minutes after Fox was available. Number three, Alyssa Milano. All right, let's talk about the show Charmed, a solid series that was on the air for 10 years. The series followed three sisters that discover their descendants of a line of good female witches and are destined to fight against the forces of evil. Yeah, it was a fun show. However, just because you play sisters on set doesn't mean that you're gonna be close in real life. Rose McGowan and Alyssa Milano had a very public altercation that resulted in a little incident on set being shared with the world. Rose claimed that Alyssa threw a fit in front of the crew, yelling that they didn't pay her enough to do the things she was doing, only she didn't say things she was doing. She said a bad word. She called Alyssa's behavior appalling, claiming that she cried every time the show got renewed for another season because it meant more time on a toxic set. Alyssa never shared her own comments on the situation and was eventually let go from the show, confirming what she was being accused of. Number two, Thomas Gibson. Thomas made a name for himself, starring as one of the leads of the series Criminal Minds. He was on the show for a few years, and in that time, he made a few problems for the people unfortunate enough to be staff members of the series. There were a few issues over the years that would have warranted some action, like screaming at producers and writers for not doing a good job, but the incident that got him kicked off the show for good involved a kick. In 2016, Thomas was swiftly fired from the series after an incident with a writer named Virgil Williams. An internal investigation revealed that Thomas kicked Virgil one day during production of an episode that Gibson was directing. Now, as I've said before, that was not the first incident on set that really should have resulted in some kind of punishment. In 2013, he pleaded no contest to no-no juice-related reckless driving after being arrested under a DUI. And three years before that, he allegedly shoved an assistant director, Ian Wolf, during a late-night location scene. That led to the studio ordering Gibson to take eight hours of anger management, which clearly worked out. According to most of the people on set though, Thomas was a wild card. Some days he'd be friendly and accommodating, and the next, nuts. And at number one, Richard Gere. Richard Gere is one of those actors that doesn't really act. You know, sometimes people just get hired for films because they have a face for it or a style. For Richard Gere, he did not have enough class and moxie to keep a handle on his role in the film, The Lords of the Flatbush. Now he was cast to star alongside Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone. And according to Sly, these two just didn't get along. Their beef was strong and long lasting throughout production until it finally came to a head when one day, Richard was just a little bit too into one scene and grabbed Sylvester aggressively by his collar. When Sly told him to lay off, he laid in instead. Now, the scene was being filmed on Coney Island, and when the actors took a minute to take a break, they tried to break each other. Sly was eating a hot dog alone in his car. Sounds peaceful, right? Well, then suddenly Richard came in and joined him with half of a chicken dripping in mustard. Despite Sly's warning about the mustard, it dripped all over his pants, and in true Rocky fashion, he elbowed Richard in the face and threw him out of his car. The altercation resulted in Richard being fired from the project. Oh no! We have to decide between Richard Gere and Sylvester Stallone. I wonder how quick that decision was. Conor McGregor, a name that lit up the world of combat sports like a firework. McGregor was divisive, no question about it, but love him or hate him, his ascent was nothing short of spectacular. The spotlight shone so bright it led him straight to a blockbuster bout with none other than Floyd Mayweather. The buildup was classic, Conor's verbal sparring match where no punches were pulled. But as the bout drew closer, something shifted. The sharp wit that had catapulted McGregor to stardom seemed to dim. When he finally stepped into the ring with Mayweather, it wasn't just a fight, it was the end of an era. Mayweather shattered the invincible image Conor had crafted. The climactic showdown with Khabib was more than a fight, and McGregor returned not to the cheer of charm, but to the echoes of animosity. The exhibition was striking, yet it peeled back the layers we hadn't seen before. That night, humiliation was served cold, and the world watched as the notorious icon spiraled into chaos. He got humiliated badly and everything went wild. Before the era of social media dominated headlines, one female star shone the brightest on the world stage, Whitney Houston. She wasn't just a celebrated singer, she was an icon holding an incredible record for seven straight number one hits on the Billboard Top 100. With over 200 million records sold and notching up 28 Guinness World Records, Whitney was, without question, a musical juggernaut. 
The only other star who could match her level of fame was the legendary Michael Jackson. But from 2000 to 2005, Whitney's life took a tragic turn. Her tumultuous marriage to Bobby Brown, a harrowing struggle with addiction, and the chaos of her reality TV show wreaked havoc on her illustrious career. And despite a valiant attempt to rise again with a world tour in 2009 to 2010, audiences witnessed a starkly different Whitney. The once undeniably flawless voice struggled to reach high notes, the range had dimmed, and numerous performances including a particularly infamous one in Australia were marred by delays and vocal issues. Disappointment filled the air as many shows plummeted into disarray, leading to an overwhelming consensus that her comeback tour was unsuccessful. Despite further attempts to regain her status, Whitney never reclaimed the once effortless pinnacle of her career. Her precipitous decline remains one of the most poignant examples of a superstar's fall from grace in the music industry. Aaron Hernandez, a former tight end for the New England Patriots, stood at the precipice of a gleaming career in the NFL. Flush with success, he was newly signed to a promising contract, his future in the league all but assured. Tragically, a series of life-altering decisions led him down a dark path that shocked the nation. Hernandez was convicted of ending the life of his friend and in the midst of attempting to overturn his sentence, he ultimately took his own life. This shadowy tale of a star fallen from grace is a stark reminder of how quickly a life can unravel, leaving more questions than answers in its wake. Aaron's story is not an isolated incident. Many other professional athletes have experienced similar downward spirals due to a variety of factors such as fame, pressure to perform, and personal struggles. Next up, Kurt Cobain. For a short period, Nirvana rose to immense fame, becoming one of the most significant rock bands globally. However, Kurt struggled with the spotlight and grappled with personal battles, including substance abuse. Nirvana's 92 Reading Festival appearance is etched in history as one of rock's finest live shows. In Utero, released in early 93, soared to the top despite being initially deemed non-viable by the label and facing backlash from retailers over controversial content. Their raw and haunting MTV Unplugged performance in November 93 was uncertain until the very last due to Cobain's dependency struggles. Sadly, in March 94, after a purposeful overdose and a fleeting stint in rehab, Cobain's life ended tragically. Despite its brief existence less than seven years with a limited discography including major labels, albums, the band's impact was seismic, selling over 75 million records. It's a stark tale of rapid ascension against a dark downward spiral. Amanda Bynes, once the quintessential girl next door with a sparkling presence in numerous teen movies, faced a tumultuous journey that led her from the pinnacle of Hollywood success to personal struggles with addiction and a highly publicized conservatorship. Her story is one that reflects both the pressures of fame and the resilience it takes to confront personal demons under the relentless scrutiny of the public eye. Amanda Bynes rose to stardom at a young age with her breakout role on the sketch comedy show All That and later starring in her own hit sitcom, The Amanda Show. She quickly became known for her comedic talent and charm, captivating audiences with her infectious energy. Her success only continued to grow as she landed leading roles in popular films such as What a Girl Wants and She's the Man. But as her star continued to rise, so did the pressure and expectations placed upon her. In 2010, Bynes announced her retirement from acting at just 24 years old, citing a desire to pursue fashion design instead. However, that decision was met with skepticism and criticism from the media and fans alike who viewed it as a sign of her unraveling mental state. Next, we're dissecting the extraordinary fall from grace of a once revered icon, OJ Simpson. It was a downfall that truly blindsided the public. Once celebrated as an exceptional athlete, OJ Simpson's transition to a life overshadowed by legal controversies took the world aback. But beyond the spotlight and brand deals, there lay a turbulent story waiting to unravel. This infamous trial shed light on the flaws within the criminal justice system and raised questions about privilege and celebrity status. The OJ Simpson case opened up discussions about wealth, power, and the influence of public perception on the outcome of a trial. But beyond the legal proceedings and media frenzy, there are also personal tragedies at play in OJ's story. From his tumultuous marriage to Nicole Brown Simpson to his strained relationship with his children, we gained a deeper understanding of the impact that fame and success can have on one's personal life. 
Moving on, we delve into the tumultuous narrative of Charlie Sheen's career. A high profile figure whose descent in Hollywood serves as a cautionary tale. Despite being a top earning actor on the hit TV show Two and a Half Men, Sheen's public persona took a nosedive amid personal turmoil and widely publicized controversy. Throughout his career, Sheen has been known for his charismatic and rebellious attitude, often playing similar characters on screen. However, it was his off screen behavior that truly caught the attention of the public. In 2011, Sheen's erratic behavior became a topic of concern and speculation after a series of bizarre interviews and outbursts. He notably coined phrases such as winning and tiger blood, which became a viral sensation. As the media frenzy surrounding Sheen's behavior continued, his personal life also came under scrutiny. He had a history of substance and alcohol abuse as well as tumultuous relationships. In 2010, he was arrested for domestic violence against his then wife, Brooke. Mueller. While we have all witnessed a multitude of surprising events at award shows over the years, few could have forecasted the incident involving Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Oscars. The altercation not only sent shockwaves throughout Hollywood, but also initiated a cascade of repercussions for Smith's career. The notorious slap seen around the world instantly transformed the public's perception of Will Smith from a beloved actor to a figure of controversy. The ramifications were swift, with projects put on hold and endorsements under threat as the industry grappled with the implications of his actions. The video footage of the incident spread like wildfire on social media and news outlets, leaving many shocked and outraged. The backlash was immediate with fans expressing their disappointment and disbelief in the actor's behavior. The incident was a stark contrast to Will Smith's image as a family friendly, charismatic, and well respected figure in Hollywood. What drives a man who's already in the limelight to yearn for even more? For Jesse Smollett, it seems it wasn't enough to be famous. He aimed to be an icon, a beacon in the fight against racism. His persistent assertion that he's still the victim as he faced his jail sentence paints a picture of someone who truly believes they've transcended fame and become a symbol through their actions. Despite being well known and successful in his career, Smollett's actions have caused a significant amount of backlash and scrutiny from the public. Many questions arise as to what drove him to allegedly stage a hate crime against himself. Perhaps it was the desire for even more fame and attention, or maybe it was a desperate attempt to elevate himself as a symbol in the fight against racism. Regardless of his motives, Smollett's behavior raises important discussions about privilege, responsibility, and the dangers of seeking validation through victimhood. And last but not least, Britney Spears. Tragically, Britney found herself in a legal tangle that left her at a severe disadvantage, almost akin to being trapped by an antiquated system. For years, she navigated through a court-sanctioned conservatorship that essentially placed her under her father's control, stripping her of autonomy until its very recent termination. The hashtag Free Britney movement has sparked a conversation about the issue of conservatorships and their implications on an individual's life. While these legal arrangements are meant to protect individuals who are unable to make decisions for themselves due to physical or mental incapacity, they can also be abused and used as a means of control. In the case of Britney, her conservatorship was put in place following a series of public breakdowns and mental health struggles. However, many have argued that she was unfairly placed under the control of her father, who allegedly used the arrangement to not only manage her finances, but also restrict her personal life and career choices. The Smith family has been in major gossip sources almost every month for the past three years. It seems as though they may never catch a break, but more importantly, it seems like we, the gossip people, will never run out of content and anecdotes. Jumping right in, we have their separation. Jada recently revealed that the pair, who everyone assumed was still unhappily married, have actually been separated for years, and everything that has happened between the two since 2016 has all occurred when they were not in an official relationship. And wow, a lot has happened. The separation was revealed alongside a myriad of other strange confessions and was followed by some even crazier revelations, which we will get into. The two say that they have always loved each other very deeply and that they always will, even going so far as to say that they are not planning to divorce, but they wanted to officially separate and provide a 
each other's space, which brings us to our next point. Up next is the revelation that Jada and Will were in an open marriage. I mean, this comes as no surprise to anyone, right? Like, come on. Now, a couple years back, this was all anyone was talking about. How Will Smith and Jada were in an open relationship, but only Jada was partaking openly, and by that I mean in the public eye. The man that Jada had begun a relationship with actually moved into the house with the happy husband and wife. This arrangement definitely created an even more tense environment for the group of them, and I can't imagine having to live with that. I mean, my parents split up earlier this year, and living with them even for one month while things got packed up was a pretty awkward and tense experience. Thinking of one of them inviting their partner to come live with us? Yeah, I'd press pause on that one. Some secrets should not come out, like Jada's hesitation to marry and the emotional reaction that she had on her wedding day. Jada and Will got married when they were very young, and it was actually Jada's mother who pressured her into the marriage because she really liked Will and saw a lot of potential in him. However, that decision aged poorly, obviously. For Will's birthday, she posted a fairly old photo of them with their two kids and one of Jada's sons from her previous relationship. Many fans sent birthday wishes, but there were a few, a good amount, who made snarky remarks and rehashed lines from Red Table Talks, contradicting the photo in the post. Some people commented on how she didn't love him romantically, and a clip came up of her saying how she cried all the way down the aisle because she did not want to be married to him, and how she felt pressured to be wed even though she never wanted to get married. Next up, we have the bonus son. Well, many know of the existence of Jaden and Willow Smith, not a lot know about the existence of the third son. Trey Smith was the product of Will's previous marriage to Cherie Zampino and tends to fly under the radar in the eye of the media. In 2018, Jada brought Zampino on her show and spilled the tea on the real story behind Trey, their relationship to each other and Will's role as his biological father. For many Smith fans, this is the first time anyone had even heard about Trey. Will claims that he had to distance himself from Trey and his mother following the divorce. Will recounts struggling to maintain a healthy enough relationship with Zampino for him to play the role of Trey's father figure. Trey was raised by his mom alone, growing up feeling betrayed and abandoned by Will. Eventually, Will made amends and became a proper part of Trey's life, but for a long time, Trey was kept hidden from the public, surely leaving a stain on the family unit that can never be washed away. Next up, Complex Grandpa. This one is really dark. Like, okay, kind of in a funny way, because it's not actually dark, I guess. Like, the dark thing didn't happen, but no, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty dark. Will Smith released a memoir called Will in 2021 that was chock full of info that you would have to waterboard out of me or pay me a huge sum of money. Okay, yeah, I, I, I get it, Will. Proceed. The actor explains that while he was growing up, his father physically harmed himself and his mom on continuous and frequent occasions. So, in return for this treatment, he vowed to seek revenge for his mother when he was older and capable of more. Eventually, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Will was forced to care for him while he was bedridden. Will saw this as the perfect opportunity to take his dad down. He wrote, One night, as I delicately wheeled him from his bedroom toward the bathroom, a darkness arose within me. He then went on to describe the moment he contemplated pushing him down the stairs. He noted that no one would have suspected him, and the moment was just perfect. He wrote, I'm one of the best actors in the world. My 911 call would be Academy Award level. Will ultimately decided not to end his father's life, instead taking care of him until his passing in 2016. Of natural causes, I think. Next is dating pre-Slapgate. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jada Pinkett Smith has revealed a ton, a ton of information once thought to just be rumors. Well, we've already covered the fact that she has been separated from Will Smith for a while now, another fun piece of information has also been revealed. I don't know if it's fun, but it's information. Anyway, it's been revealed that before Chris Rock was slapped across the face by Will Smith live at the Oscars, Chris had actually asked Jada Pinkett Smith out on a date. Now, when you hear that, you must think, oh, he asked her out before they even met. Nope. The situation actually took place in 2016 at the height of the first round of separation rumors, which it turned out are completely true. At the time, Chris either had some inside info or he believes everything he reads online. According to Jada, Chris reached out and shot his shot, I guess. He called and he said he would love to take her out, which she was like, why? He clarified and told Jada he was under the impression that herself and Will were getting a divorce for real. When she revealed that this wasn't the case, Chris was so 
embarrassed and began to apologize over and over. Though they eventually moved past the moment, it may explain why Will Smith was so aggressive with Rock at the Oscars. There's no way he was unaware of the situation. Next up, we have the Smiths self-raised tots. Rumors have been flying around for years that Willow and Jaden Smith basically raised themselves. Their upbringing was nothing to scoff at. Jaden was on track to becoming an actor after starring in the 2008 remake of the classic Karate Kid series alongside martial arts and opera legend Jackie Chan, but later shifted his focus to a more entrepreneurial side of things, developing his own fashion brand, which has garnered him massive success. His sister Willow opted to stick with her creative roots, however, has made quite the name for herself in music. Unfortunately, their behavior comes from a place of neglect. During an episode of Red Table Talk, Jaden confronted his parents, calling out their terrible parenting skills. With both being so busy in their careers, they were never home to care for the youngsters. Jaden and Willow recount spending a majority of their childhood with various nannies and teachers, only seeing their parents between projects or if they were working with their parents, like Jaden and Will in the pursuit of happiness. It turns out they were all well aware of the whole separation thing from the very beginning as well. Will and Jada must have been waiting until the kids were financially independent and out of the house to finally call it quits, something they should have done a lot sooner. In that same vein, we have the horrid story of Willow Smith's stalker. In 2021, on her mother's talk show, Red Table Talk, Willow Smith revealed the heartbreaking, terrifying tale of her being cyberstalked. Cyberstalking is a little bit more insidious and scary. This guy was doing that to me, and he was actually doing that to me for a couple of years. He basically got my patterns, Willow Smith had stated. In December 2020, while on a vacation and absent from her house, the stalker broke into her home. Her mother, Jada Pinkett Smith, located a camp that was set up behind the house created by the stalker. His intention was to wait for Willow to return home. Jada immediately called the police and the authorities recommended throwing out the contents of the fridge and cabinets in case the stalker had placed something harmful in the food. Willow Smith decided to take the stalker to court, filing for a restraining order against him. It was discovered that the man had been stalking her online for years. The restraining order was granted, but Willow Smith still has severe trauma from the whole experience. Next up, we have the birthday brawl, literally. For Jada's 37th birthday, Will decided it would be a great idea to throw a massive surprise party. Now, it wasn't just their celebrity friends, some close family and what have you. He hired party planners to set it up and spent three days planning and getting everything ready, which really isn't that much time. He even booked Mary J. Blige to perform for her. Talk about a birthday gift, but that was not all. He traced her family roots and invited her family members from her long line of lineage. Not only did he find her family, he went out of his way to reach out and invite them to the party. You'd think she'd appreciate this labor of love, eh. but instead she threw it back in his face, claiming he only did it to display his ego, and she hated the fact that he went out of his way to throw a party. He admitted he was devastated when she said those hurtful things, and it even sent him on a downward spiral that negatively impacted his life. This should have been one of the biggest of many red flags. I mean, if somebody just brought my entire family just from nowhere, that would be pretty scary. I, I don't I don't think I'd like that either. I'm kind of with Jada on this one. Finally, we have Tupac. Jada was in a long-term relationship with Tupac years before she met Will, and his untimely passing was the end of their relationship. It's normal and even healthy to miss someone who passed, especially when you were romantically involved with them for years. But in 2012, while she and Will were still married, she posted a picture of her and Tupac in a very intimate embrace, and she captioned the photo, I miss him. It makes sense wanting to share your deep feelings with the world, especially when they're affecting you the most. But that was a questionable photo to choose to post, especially when you're married to someone else. Not to mention Will and Jada's daughter, Willow, wrote a letter addressed to Tupac after he passed because Willow claimed she knew he was still alive. One of the lines in the letter read, can you please come back so mommy and me can be happy? I think my mommy really misses you. It seems sweet and rather innocent, but at a young age, she was aware of how much he still had a hold on Jada and she wanted him to come back into their lives, which at that point seemed like it could have been the end of Will and Jada's marriage. Nothing came of it, obviously, but it makes you question how much Willow actually knew about the situation. Number 10 underpaying celebrities. This past week on Instagram, Taraji P. Henson delivered a tearful interview that touched on her financial struggles and alluded to the fact that she was being underpaid. And all of this happened while she was promoting the new musical, The Color Purple, which was produced by Oprah herself. During this interview, she expressed that she was tired of working hard and getting paid a fraction of what she deserved. In fact, at one point she said she was even contemplating leaving her acting career behind. She told the host that she hears people talk about how hard she works, but the math just isn't mathing. So there is an entire team of people above her that make the 
majority of the money in the film industry. She voiced her frustrations that every time she does something and breaks through another glass ceiling in Hollywood, when it comes time to negotiate, she is somehow at the bottom again like she never did what she just did. So that wears on her mental health because the question is, why? And what does it mean for her as an actor? Gabrielle Union was there and she backed up her claims saying that there was not a word of a lie told by this woman. Viola Davis also reposted that clip to her Instagram simply with the caption this with a few hands pointing up. A little while back Taraji was seriously considering leaving the US altogether and living in another country. Considering how stellar of an actor she is along with the rest of the cast, Hollywood really needs to get their act together and just pay their people. Number 9 Black Ball now this story is crazy. The famous comedian Monique has spoken out about confronting Oprah Winfrey over an episode of her talk show that involved her estranged family in 2010. She accused Oprah as well as filmmakers Lee Daniels and Tyler Perry of blackballing her in the industry. So in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Monique recounted the strain in her relationship with Oprah because of the time that the talk show host welcomed her estranged family, including her eldest brother, onto the show in 2010. Following her Oscar win that year, Oprah informed Monique that her brother called her and wanted to be on the show to let parents know how they can watch out for creepy people. Apparently she said, do you want to come on the show? Because he wants to apologize to you. In response she said, Oprah I don't want any part of that. While she gave her blessing to tape the show with her brother, she was horrified to see other family members like her parents and another one of her brothers downplay what actually happened to her. Yeah. Number 8. Dissing The View While speaking on The View earlier this week, Oprah appeared to drop some major shade both towards the film, The Color Purple, and the people who were involved with The View. So the producers of The View were very upset that she would not be appearing alongside the cast of the film on one of their episodes. They were hoping to have a kind of reunion involving Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah, because as we know they both starred in the 1985 version of The Color Purple. But that turned out to be a missed opportunity because Oprah did did not appear on the program. The reason that The View was particularly annoyed with her absence is because she has been appearing on other talk shows to promote the film. She went on the Drew Barrymore show and Sherry Shepard's Sherry. So around the same time she gave a candid interview with People magazine about her recent weight loss and how she was aided by medication. But back to The View, despite Oprah's absence, the episode was well received and Whoopi said that she felt a strong connection with the people who did end up showing up. Number 7. That Drew Barrymore moment It seems like Drew just cannot keep her hands to herself and fans have become quite outraged at her behaviour. The actress was blasted as cringy after uncomfortably caressing Oprah Winfrey on an episode of The Drew Barrymore Show. In the clip, the two of them were seen cozied up on the couch while talking about the importance of interacting with the studio audience. Drew tightly held onto Oprah's hand while running her other hand up and down her arm. She said, Something that I learned about you because I didn't know this in detail was that you would spend time with the audience outside of the show you were filming. Oprah then seemed to be trying to get out of her grasp because she adjusted her seating position while answering that question. She said, It is necessary. My crew used to be like, Oh my god, how much time are you going to spend talking to the audience? Drew then let go of her guest while she was preparing to ask something else. For her part, Oprah then started talking with her hands while applauding Drew for running the daytime talk show without an audience during the pandemic. Number 6. The NDAs Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood as we know. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made Tom Cruise's muffin. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign the document. Apparently one former employee by the name of Elizabeth Cody tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was stopped by the courts because she was still tied to the agreement that she signed. These NDAs were not meant to be a way just to keep the show secret safe, but any and all secrets that Oprah kept as well. According to Elizabeth, the documents were signed by almost everyone in her life. Now she might have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that is not exactly how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company, Unica's Performance Training, claiming that they were being fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving the advertising with her name or the website of the show. Number 5. Strange Beliefs Oprah has had 
plenty of controversial people on her show, from the so-called medical experts to psychologists and even celebrities. But one particular incident that caused a lot of backlash for her was when she did an interview with Suzanne Somers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets about how she was able to look so young. According to Summers, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help, and she claims that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone in her other arm. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and a self-help author, but surprisingly, she was not. A medical experts started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses, potentially even cancer. Despite Suzanne's claim that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and are safe, they are actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you could buy from a pharmacy. So Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that the methods were useful, even claiming to have used these methods to make her feel incredible. So this person would rather risk her audience potentially getting cancer than just tell them the truth. Number four, the car situation. So everyone knows Oprah's famous words, you get a car and you get a car and everyone gets a car. This was a historical moment of her series and it was parodied time and time again. In fact, it is still memed to this day. However, what many people don't know is that when someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. Of course there is. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay over $7,000 in taxes first, while Oprah's studio would cover the sales tax and the registration for each car, their audience members were given a choice to either pay the seven grand or simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box that was all caught on camera that Oprah claimed to be there for the new car. But of course, everything has a catch. For someone who was known as being charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something completely different to Oprah. Number three, fake memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996 and had a reading encouragement segment on her talk show where she talked about any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, Oprah picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Brett about his years long struggle with substance issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best selling nonfiction book of the year, and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called Gut Wrenching. But the following year, a news outlet ran an explosive article about Frey after it was discovered that he had either made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. But it turned out that he was never on that train, nor did he have any involvement in that situation. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked James why he felt the need to lie to herself and her readers, and he tried everything, making every excuse in the world. He claimed that he altered a lot of details, but that the overall plot was still real. The studio audience then responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps, and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience as it was not her intention. But by that point, the damage was already done. Number two, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka unwelcome to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appears on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turned out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub and Whoopi confronted her leading to an adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad, to which Oprah replied, why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me. 
And after this, they mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute. And coming in at number one, Sydney Crawford. The model and actress called out Oprah over her 1986 interview that took place on her talk show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Cindy reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV+. This documentary spotlights the careers of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course, Cindy Crawford. So in a clip from the documentary, Oprah is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked, did she always have this body? This is unbelievable. Stand up. Now that is what I call a body. At this point, Cindy is visibly uncomfortable and then she stands up before the studio audience cheered and showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment being told what to do. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type of situation. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do. But eventually it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for her was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman who was supposedly known for her kindness and generosity also made her feel like a puppet. Number 10, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of The Woman in Me, a memoir by Britney Spears, is of course a revelation on what really happened while she was dating her Mickey Mouse Club co-star, Justin Timberlake. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection and their connection was strong, but unfortunately, Britney had to make a terrible decision in the year Year 2000 when she found out she was pregnant and at first she was very excited about the whole thing because she wanted to be a parent. In her book she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin but I guess it was just going to be a little bit earlier than she expected. Well it turns out Justin not so excited and told her that they were both too young to start a family. Continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. This revelation may be part of the reason that Justin reportedly was so nervous leading up to the book's release and since the book's release he's had to turn off his Instagram notifications because hey, he's terrible and people want to let him know. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her, she would have gone through with a pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims that she only did this because Justin clearly didn't want to be the dad, and in the book she said that looking back, it was one of the most agonizing things she had ever experienced in her life. Number nine, Jamie Foxx. So this is one of the more recent secrets that's been revealed, so to speak. Uh, so far, this is just an allegation, but a woman is suing Jamie Foxx for alleged physical mistreatment at a rooftop restaurant. The allegations are being backed up by a two eyewitnesses, a friend of the victim, and a security guard who saw the whole thing go down and let it happen. According to the unnamed woman, she spotted Jamie at a restaurant around 11 p.m. and after a couple of hours decided to ask him for a picture. Jamie was apparently under the influence and according to the accuser, he became very handsy as the night progressed. He said yes to the picture and then apparently said that the woman had a model's body and smelled good. Then there are some darker and honestly pretty disturbing details that I can't go into in this channel, but if they're true, something tells me Jamie's career may be done. Truly just dark stuff. The court case is being brought forward as the Survivors Act is about to be implemented in the US. This act allows victims of physical offenses to bring civil cases to court after the statute of limitations has expired. The statute means that after a certain amount of time has passed, the victim can no longer file criminal charges. However, the new act means that civil cases are good to go. So we will see what happens to Jamie in the coming weeks. Number eight, Lizzo. Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of the lawsuit being brought up against her, it looks like all that positivity may have just been an act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I'm not a small man. In fact, I have what many call a dad bod, and I'm very cool with it. So I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves, but come on, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shames her team and makes them feel that they are too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these claims. One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who is part of this lawsuit, was fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently and her apparently disliking the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that she wasn't committing to the role. She was also bringing her dancers to weird places and making them do weird things. Lizzo was at a club at Amsterdam's Red Light District when she coerced, aka 
they forced a dancer to touch a woman's bare chest despite saying no several times. She also made them eat bananas from some no-no zones. Again, nobody's idea of fun. Currently, there is still a court case up in the air and no one knows what will happen, but so far Lizzo is maintaining that she did nothing and will prove her innocence. Number seven, Russell Brand. Even before the controversy surrounding Russell Brand came up this year, this dude was unwelcome everywhere. Royal events, awards shows, kids birthday parties, who knows? For anyone who doesn't know, I'm really sorry to be the one to tell you, but Russell Brand is a terrible person. The man known best as a comedian, a bringer of joy, was secretly manipulative, aggressive, and at times violent with his ex-partners. Following in the news that a documentary about his life and career was set to release on BBC's Channel 4, several complaints got filed against him, alleging mistreatment during their time together. The allegations were actually reinforced by Russell's ex, Katy Perry, who they dated for quite some time, and she came to learn that Russell was short-tempered, opinionated, and stubborn. Russell's career was canceled, and he's currently awaiting a trial. Number six, Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors is currently the man behind Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. He was written as an important person in that franchise, being a villain in a couple of movies, and recently a villain in the Loki TV show. Unfortunately for Jonathan Majors, an ex has come forward and alleged that Jonathan was physically violent towards her while they were together. Since March of this year, Majors and his team had been adamant that the situation was blown out of proportions and that there really is nothing to be upset about, which is always a fun thing to say to people during these situations. In fact, in June, Majors filed his own cross complaint accusing his accuser. The prosecutors refuted these claims and told him they had no plans on prosecuting Grace Japari, who was the woman who accused him. Majors has been dropped from his agency and so far his role on TV and film is pretty up in the air. I mean, his character Kang may even be kicked out of the MCU and replaced by Doctor Doom, so let's see what happens as the year progresses. Number five, Jada Pinkett Smith. Cheating rumors and dating scandals followed Jada and Will throughout their entire relationship. Since day one, people were convinced that they were in an open relationship or had just been straight up cheating on each other. Turns out that those rumors were kind of true, because ahead of the release of her book Worthy, Jada sat down with People Magazine and every other news outlet to share some inside info. The most revealing one was that herself and Will Smith were actually separated for seven years. Of course, that's not all though. Jada is slowly ruining that guy's life and then some. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016, they just became exhausted with each other. The news of their separation was a mild shock at best because Super Sleuth fans claimed that they had proof Will and Jada were separated a long time ago. Some of the clips that were submitted as evidence of Will and Jada disprove it because Will and Jada was on Red Table Talk and he looks drained. He just looks like a man dealing with so much mentally speaking. In her conversation with Will, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just outright admitting the information, she decided to hold on to it until the release of her book. A lot of Jada fans commented on the resurfaced clips, and we can all agree just Will is having a rough time, and I, I just feel for this guy at this point. I could go on and on about how terrible Jada Pinkett Smith is, but I've only got a couple of minutes, and I already wrote a lot of lists about why she's bad, so go check him out. Number four, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991. And despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids cartoon, the crew had a small following and garnered quite a bit of success. Enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted, picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark play the leading man, Danny Wallace, a police officer who attempts to stop substance trafficking and corruption by the Chinese triads. He had a successful acting career that's recently been declining in quality, but he's still acting and he looks great at 52, so please don't don't hurt me, Mark Wahlberg. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young and he became addicted to No No Snow by the time he was 13. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested at the age of 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was walking home late one night under the influence of hallucinogens when he spotted the men. Close friends at the time confirmed that Mark did have a bit of a racial bias with his upbringing, which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who, you know, wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them, which made contact and knocked one of them unconscious. He was eventually released after serving only 45 days of a two-year prison sentence, and he vowed to change his life forever. So far, that promise seems to be kept, and I can personally confirm that he's a very polite and patient person because he watched a movie at a theater I used to work at. He travels with like five people at all times. It's a little intimidating. Number three, Margot Robbie. Margot may be a perfect Barbie on screen, but apparently behind the scenes, she may be a psycho. In a recent interview with BBC Radio 1, Margot reminisced about a little prank she pulled on an old babysitter. It involved kitchen cutters, which is the word I'm forced to use for no 
See, they bleep it out. Apparently, Margot has just gotten a new babysitter, a much older woman that just was not as cool as Talia, her old babysitter. So she hatched a plan of sweet, sweet revenge. After a particularly trying day where Margot refused to take a bath, she decided to kick the old lady out for good and grabbed ketchup, a stabby jabby device, and laid face down on the kitchen tiles. You know, the old I'm kind of dead routine. As you may expect, her babysitter walked in, took one look, screamed, and just jogged out the door. She was gone. She traumatized the woman who quit, and Margot successfully got her old babysitter back. But that's very messed up, and Margot was so young when she did that. That is so dark. A dark place for someone's mind to go that early on. Was she secretly a little crazy this whole time? Might explain why she is the best Harley Quinn we've ever seen on screen. Number two, Tim Allen. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear, the star of ABC's popular sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. And while he may have played a family man on TV, a lot of fans may not know that Tim was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some pretty bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a couple of bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport and was caught with more than 650 grams 1.4 pounds of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 grams or more. Like there was a guy from the government just next to his car like, oh, 650, all right, well, if you got 650, then you're going to jail. However, that sentence was never served and it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities, it led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state one, so he was able to ignore that new policy. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. So think about this entire entry and tell me that wouldn't be a great movie. Number one, Danny Matheson. Danny Matheson was that 70s show's popular boy and it helped launch several careers, including Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, and of course himself. Danny was also on this show and it turns out the allegations against him date back to 2004 and were reported in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation took place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production of that 70s show and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table because it was just that time, so Danny was let go and the whole thing was forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila watched this dude shut down their project and still said, hey, he's a great guy. When the charges come up again 15 years later, people are still sticking to his side that he was friends with, but it turns out that he was an actual menace and a horrible person and he's gonna go to jail. Thankfully in 2023 it's a lot easier to confirm allegations like this and he was recently sentenced to three years in prison. In an ironic twist that only the digital age could serve up, it seems even the great Oprah isn't immune to a social media slip up. Picture this, you're scrolling through your feed when you see Oprah praising the Microsoft Surface, claiming it's her go-to gift for the holiday. Quite the endorsement, right? Well not so fast. Eagle-eyed followers quickly spotted something amiss. The tweet was sent from an iPad. The rival tech of the surface. Talk about being caught in the act. Not the best look when you're trying to give a shout out to a product that supposedly won your heart. Or at least that's what sponsors would like everyone to believe. It's a modern day tale of endorsements gone wrong and a reminder that on the internet, Someone's always watching. This mishap with Oprah leads us into a broader conversation about the authenticity of celebrity endorsements. In the age of social media, it peels back the curtain on the fact that sometimes endorsements are less about personal preference and more about contractual agreements. It's a stark reminder to consumers that while celebrity backing might bring a product to our attention, it doesn't always mean it's their genuine gadget of choice. Oprah has been called out for using weight loss medication despite being a longtime ambassador for Weight Watchers. The famous talk show host confirmed she was using this medication to help her weight. In a revealing chat, she said her slim figure is thanks to the medication and a healthier lifestyle overall. She's admitted to using the weight loss med Ozempic, and no one is saying that she should be hated for doing what she wants to her body, but she should think about the unrealistic standards she has set when she was initially lying about taking meds for weight loss while promoting Weight Watchers. Oprah has stepped into the spotlight not to host a show, but to address the recent criticisms around the People's Fund of Maui, a cause she passionately advocates for. Along with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Oprah launched this heartfelt initiative seeding a staggering $10 million to assist 
assist those affected by Maui's devastating wildfires. The goal was straightforward, provide direct financial support to the victims. However, not everyone saw it that way. The internet erupted with heated debates, some accusing the duo of not doing enough despite their considerable donation. Oprah's reply? She genuinely believed that their contribution was substantial. The kind that would typically receive a standing ovation at fundraising galas. But the morning after their big pledge, instead of applause, there was a digital uproar. I woke up, checked the news, and was met with a barrage of negativity, Oprah recounted on CBS Mornings. Describing the intense scrutiny she faced, Dwayne Johnson, deeply connected to the islands by heritage and childhood memories, has yet to weigh in on the controversy. And let's talk about the time Ludacris made an appearance on Oprah's show. Now the dude was there to shine a light on his role in the movie Crash. You know, that intense drama from 2004 that snagged a bunch of awards, but things didn't go as planned. Luda opens up about how instead of focusing on the movie, he found himself in the hot seat facing some tough questions about his hip hop lyrics. He wasn't shy about saying the final cut of the interview seemed to lean heavily in Oprah's favor with some of his key points on the cutting room floor. She kept her own comments while a lot of mine got axed, he shared in a GQ interview. It turns out Luda wasn't even slated to be on the show initially. They called him up last minute. And after all that, Oprah had a private chat with him expressing her views on what it means to feature rappers on her show. Ludacris compares the whole experience to an awkward visit where you feel like the host isn't thrilled to have you over. In a scorching critique, actress Rose McGowan has leveled some heavy accusations against one of television's most beloved figures. In an explosive tweet, McGowan lashed out calling Oprah as fake as they come. She expresses a sense of vindication that the the public is starting to see a side of Oprah she perceives as disingenuous. McOwen, a pivotal voice in the hashtag MeToo movement, doesn't mince words, openly wishing the renowned talk show host's authenticity to match her public persona. The Twitter war between Rose and Oprah has made headlines with many wondering where the root of their animosity lies. It seems that McOwen's main issue with Winfrey stems from her perceived hypocrisy in light of recent events involving an extremely controversial person. She's been vocal about holding powerful figures accountable for their actions, and in this case she believes Winfrey is not practicing what she preaches. This raises an important question about how much we truly know about the people we idolize and put on a pedestal in our society. In her stirring speech at the Golden Globe Awards, Oprah once again demonstrated why she is considered such a powerful and motivational figure. Her successful entrepreneurial journey, her impactful philanthropy, and her natural heartfelt connect with people are truly commendable. However, there's a twist in the tale. Over time, Oprah has, through different media avenues unintentionally promoted some questionable health practices. This very aspect had the scientific community in a bit of an uproar. On YouTube, we often talk about the influence celebrities have on public opinion, and Oprah's case is particularly fascinating. Notably boosted Dr. Oz's popularity, who, despite being a charming TV personality, has faced criticism for advocating medical advice and products lacking scientific backing. Consider the episode with the green coffee bean extract, a supposed weight loss miracle that fell flat after closer scrutiny and legal intervention. It's concerning when only a fraction of health recommendations on a show like The Dr. Oz Show stand up to scientific validation. And yet, even after distancing herself slightly by canceling Oz's radio show amidst professional pushback, Oprah maintains ties with him showcasing the complex relationship between media influence, celebrity endorsement, and evidence-based medicine. In another contentious twist in media careers, Oprah played a pivotal role in the rise of Philip, Dr. Phil McGraw, who now reigns as daytime TV top earner. Portrayed as the valiant hero who saves people from the grips of addiction, Dr. Phil's approach is not without its detractors. A joint investigation by Stat and the Boston Globe cast a critical eye on the Dr. Phil show, revealing troubling allegations that in chasing ratings, the welfare of certain guests was jeopardized, facing withdrawal without proper medical aid, and episodes indicating coercive nudges towards dangerous situations just to procure meds. As intense as these revelations are, the show's spokesperson denies them all. Further probing unearthed evidence suggesting that the carrot for treatment centers to buy into Dr. Phil's virtual reality venture, a series of VR scenarios where he offers advice, is none other than the promise of publicity across his and related platforms. While Oprah Winfrey's intentions in championing alternative medicine are likely well-intentioned, her influence has unfortunately had a negative impact on scientific understanding amongst the American populace. This phenomenon, often referred to as the oprah 
regulation of medicine is a concern that surgical oncologist Dr. David Gorski, a contributor to the science-based medicine website, has expressed disappointment over. As pointed out by A.V. Salk of the Washington Post, should Winfrey ever decide to enter the political arena, her advocacy for unconventional medical practices could present numerous challenges that would need addressing during her campaign. With an estimated 44 million viewers per week, Oprah has a powerful platform to spread her beliefs and opinions, and while she may have good intentions with her advocacy for alternative medicine, her influence has unfortunately led to a dangerous trend of misinformation and pseudoscience. Dr. Gorski points out, Winfrey's promotion of unproven or debunked treatments can have harmful consequences for those who trust her and follow her advice. In the Apple TV Plus docuseries, The Supermodels, Cindy Crawford has dropped some bombshell comments about a moment with Oprah that's got the internet seriously buzzing. So buckle up, because we're going back to 1986 when a 20-year-old Cindy graced the Oprah Winfrey show. But here's the twist. Cindy, alongside her agent, John Casablancas, didn't just sit for a chat. She had to stand and showcase her model physique. Fast forward to the docuseries and Cindy is calling out this moment as not cool, especially by today's standards. It's a real look-see moment as Cindy felt objectified, a stark contrast to Oprah's celebrated history of empowering women, but Hey, opinions differ, and entertainment reporter Stephanie Tacky offers a different angle, reminding us that supermodel status is often tied to their iconic figures. Was it just the nature of the 80s showbiz? Was it more about respecting Cindy's legendary career? Cindy's comments have sparked a debate about the treatment of models. In recent years, there has been a significant shift towards body positivity and embracing all body types in the fashion world. In an Elle magazine interview back in January 2006, which later circulated on TMZ, 50 Cent offered a critique of Oprah, suggesting that her originally targeted audience and point of view had shifted. He claimed Winfrey, once a voice resonating with black women, had progressively directed her content towards middle-aged white women to the point where he felt she represented that demographic. 50 Cent's remarks were accompanied by a symbolic gesture of naming his dog Oprah as a subtle jab. However, the rapper and talk show icon addressed their differences in an episode of Oprah's Next Chapter, where 50 Cent highlighted that he felt targeted by her critiques, which directly opposed the themes in his music. Number 10. Russell Brand. Even before the controversy surrounding Russell Brand came up this year, this dude was unwelcome at royal events, award shows, birthday parties, anything and everything public. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm sorry to be the one to inform you, Russell Brand is secretly a terrible person. The man known best as a comedian, a bringer of joy, has secretly been manipulative, aggressive, and at times violent with his ex-partners. Following the news that a documentary about his life and career was set to release on BBC Channel 4, several complaints were filed by exes alleging that Russell had mistreated them during their time together. The allegations were actually reinforced by Russell's ex fiance Katy Perry. They dated for over a year and a half, and in that time, she came to learn that Russell was short-tempered, opinionated, and stubborn, qualities that make a man a terrible person. Russell's career was cancelled, and he's currently awaiting a trial. Number 9. The Oprah Maui Scandal Oprah has been claiming to be many things since the Maui backlash has begun. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she's made her mark in the public as a woman who cares so much. So much that she's asking you to give her your money as well. Isn't that nice? Well, not really. The money that she donated turned out to be taxed, so she didn't actually donate anything. And of course, the main issue that people have with Oprah is that she's a billionaire asking average everyday people for money. As I've mentioned in previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah has had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her. When the fire started raging, she started fundraising. Think about all of the things that have happened in the past few years. We all forgot about Australia being on fire in 2020, Western Canada was on fire earlier this year, some parts of Florida have been underwater and are still right now. Yet, Oprah has decided to dedicate her time and money to helping out the area where she has a vacation home. Number 8. Colleen Ballinger Former YouTuber Colleen was accused by several of her young fans as being a creepy creepo who wanted to be their friend. Colleen is best known for her character Miranda Sings on YouTube, who became so popular that she received her own Netflix series. If you want to watch it, I'm sure you'll need a VPN or something, it's probably banned in every country. 
She was basically messaging her fans to deliver so-called advice when she was really trying to just manipulate them into being her little minions. And not the little yellow guys with the glasses, that'd be different. There was a massive amount of proof in the pudding. Fans had screenshots of conversations with one fan claiming that she actually sent him lingerie as a joke. <laughs> oh man, lace underwear, hilarious. Following instant backlash from the world, Colleen decided to post an apology online, which she did, while playing a ukulele. This woman is shown to be weird to everyone, and she thought it was appropriate to go online and sing about it. In response to the cringiest apology of all time, her fans resurfaced a video that really should have gotten her canceled when it first came out. A few years ago, she decided that it would be an awesome idea during one of her live shows to sing and dance to Beyonce's single ladies, while in blackface, yeah, it's just, it is the roughest clip of Colleen. She's just barefoot on stage, wildly flailing and waving her arms, and nobody at that show was like, eh, that's weird. Yeah, the world's great. Number seven, Jada Pinkett Smith. Cheating rumors and dating scandals have followed Jada and Will Smith throughout their entire relationship. Since day one, people have been convinced that they're in an open relationship or they were cheating on each other on and off. Well, it turns out that some of those rumors were actually true. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jada sat down with People Magazine to share some inside information. The most revealing was that herself and Will Smith have actually been separated for like seven years. Now, of course, that's not all. Jada's actually slowly ruining this man's life and mental health. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016, they had become exhausted with trying to make things work. The news of their separation was like a mild shock at best because super sleuth fans claim to have proof Will and Jada have been separated forever, and the proof is in the interviews. The first clip to be submitted as evidence was Will and Jada's Red Table Talk interaction, where she admitted to the entanglement with August Salzini simultaneously admitting to a brief separation. In the conversation, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just telling us right then and there, she decided to hold on to that information for a better time. A lot of Jada fans have commented on the resurfaced clip saying that Will looks drained, like he's clearly dealing with a ton mentally speaking. Now, I could go on and on about how terrible Jada is, but I've done lots of videos about that in the past, so go and check those out. Number six, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of The Woman in Me, a memoir by Britney Spears, is of course the revelation of what really happened while Britney and her Mickey Mouse Club co-star Justin Timberlake were together. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection. Their connection was strong, but unfortunately Britney had to make a difficult decision in the year 2000, after she found out she was pregnant. At first, Britney was actually pretty excited about the whole thing, you know, in her book she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin at some point, just that this was going to be a little bit earlier than she expected. Well, turns out Justin was not so excited and told her that they were both too young to be starting a family, continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. The revelation may be part of the reason that Justin has reportedly been so nervous leading up to the book's release and might be why he's turned his Instagram comments off. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her that she would have gone through with the pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims to have only done it because Justin so clearly didn't want to be the dad. In the book, she said that looking back, it is one of the most agonizing things she has ever experienced in her life. Number five, Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors is currently the man behind the purple cape of Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. Kang has been written as a very important figure in Marvel. In Ant-Man Quantumania, he was the main antagonist, only he was just acting as a variant of the real antagonist, which was an army of Kangs from across the multiverse. I know, I'm gonna get geeky for a second. Including He Who Remains, a Kang variant from Loki, who once again acted as a major part of the Loki series. Unfortunately for Majors, an ex has come forward and alleged that Jonathan was physically violent towards her while they were together. Since March of this year, Majors and his team have been adamant that the situation's blown out of proportions and that there's nothing to be upset about. In fact, in June, Majors filed his own cross-complaint accusing the accuser. Prosecutors refuted these claims and told him that they had no plans to prosecute Grace Jabari, the woman who accused him. Majors has been dropped from his agency and so far his role on TV and film is up in the air. A spoiler alert for Loki season two, the series ended with Kang not really being he who remains anymore, and it's unclear of what's gonna actually happen. Now, there have been rumors that his role in the MCU as the big bad will be replaced by Doctor Doom, so we'll see. Sorry if you don't like 
like nerdy stuff. That's just my little tangent. Number four, Lizzo. Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of a lawsuit being brought against her, it seems like all the positivity might have just been an act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I am not a small man. In fact, I have what many people consider to be a dad bod, and hey, I'm cool with that, so I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves. But like, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera, and when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shamed her team and made them feel like they were too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these claims. One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who is part of the lawsuit, was actually fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently and Lizzo apparently disliking the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that Crystal just wasn't committing to her role. She was also bringing her dancers to strange places and making them do things against their will. Lizzo was at a club in Amsterdam's red light district when she coerced, aka forced, one of her dancers to touch a woman's bare chest, not something that she wanted to do. She also made them eat bananas from some no-no zones that, again, not their idea of fun. Currently, it's still up in the air as to what the outcome will be in this trial, and so far Lizzo is maintaining that she has done nothing wrong and will prove her innocence any day. Number three, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner. Joe and Sophie got together back back in 2016 after they had been set up by mutual friends, something that they had apparently been trying to do for quite some time. They got together and instantly fell in love, getting married just over a year after getting together. Sophie admitted to Rolling Stones in 2019 that she was hesitant at first because Joe was a big musician, she was a big TV and film star, meaning that most of the time they would be on opposite ends of the world. Eventually, she warmed up and got together with Joe officially. The split came out of nowhere. For the most part, their relationship has seemed to be stable on the outside. They were never a part of cheating scandals, which is surprising considering Joe's lack of discretion. There were never any strange rumors, photos. They were just like a happy couple. As of September 1st, Joe Jonas filed for a divorce from Sophie, with the only current information being that Joe has claimed the relationship is irre irretrievably broken. Something pretty serious must have gone down in a very short amount of time because only hours before this announcement, Joe posted a photo of himself on Instagram with his ring on full display. Now, despite the minimal amount of tea spilt so far, we are in for one super messy and public divorce. Things have settled down a bit in the past few weeks, but so Sophie was actually just spotted getting cozy with another dude very recently, so you can imagine who's taking things harder at this point. Number two, Danny Matheson. That 70s show was a popular sitcom that helped launch several careers, including Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. Danny was, of course, also on that show, but it turns out the allegations that date back to 2004 surrounding Danny were uh, reported in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation took place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table, so Danny was let go and the entire thing was forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila literally watched this man go in for questioning and still called him a role model in their character witness letters. It makes no sense. Their jobs were literally stopped while this man was under investigation, and when the charge just came up again 15 years later, they were still on his side. Thankfully, in 2023, it's a lot easier to confirm allegations of this nature, and he was recently sentenced to three years in prison. So, justice served. Number one, Jonah Hill. Jonah was once the funniest man in town, shifting his efforts to the world of drama and creating a really nice career where he could just do anything he wanted, really. Unfortunately for fans of Jonah Hill, some information came out earlier this year that called his character into question. Uh, reminder, this isn't my opinion. These are things that just happen to the world in our public knowledge, okay? An ex-girlfriend of Jonah's posted screenshots from past conversations, and the conversations ranged from Jonah just asking her to tone down the photo she was posting to asking her not to do her job. For those of you who don't know, his ex Sarah works as a surfing instructor, and Jonah was asking her to not surf with men while working, and that she wear more than a bikini while she did so. 
When Sarah released these screenshots, she underlined them calling Jonah a narcissistic misogynist, but also said she didn't really want anything bad to happen to him, so eh. Since the messages have been released, there has been a massive online debate as to where Jonah stands in the eyes of the public. Some people feel that canceling him entirely is just a bit too much, and compared to some of the other scandals in Hollywood, especially that I just covered, Jonah Hill is relatively chill. Others want his name wiped from the face of the planet and never to be heard from again, so I don't know, give and take. Oh, <laughs>